Welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's MLB betting podcast. We are presented by BetMGM. It is Monday, May 15th. We hope you had a great weekend. Nice Mother's Day. Hope you won some bets in the in the sport of baseball. Brendan Glasheen with Sean Zarillo and BJ Cunningham. We are here every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, the Payoff Pitch crew. Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays. Please, folks. Rate, review, subscribe. We are celebrating more than 100 episodes of Payoff Pitch with a giveaway. So we don't really ask for much. I don't ask for much. I mean, I ask Sean and BJ for picks, and they do a fine job. Charlie, Anthony DeBundo. All I'm asking before we get into the the, the nitty-gritty, the the details of this pod, please leave a five-star rating. And you can also leave a review, whether it's positive or negative. You can give BJ a bunch of crap that he doesn't know what he's talking about in terms of loving the Red Sox and Chris Sale and why they Mm -hmm. are destined for greatness. If you Mm -hmm. just leave the five-star rating and the review can go in any direction you'd like, we would appreciate it. So you can drop who your favorite analyst is. You can drop who your least favorite analyst is too. So we haven't given you that possibility, that avenue. There you go. So, and later this month, we're going to pick a few winners who will get to choose either an item from the, our action network merchandise site. And, uh, they could also get a one year pro subscription of the award-winning action network app. Let's get into the bets for Monday, 12 games. There is a four o'clock start today between the Mets and the Nats. I don't think these guys are betting on or against Patrick Corbin today, but, uh, Sean Zarello, why don't you take it away here? Best bet for Monday. Yeah, the Cubs are grossly underpriced, I believe, today. Jamison Tyon, probably the unluckiest pitcher in baseball this season. So I've talked a lot about strikeout rate, how strikeout rate tends to stabilize quicker than other data points. Tyon, highest strikeout rate of his career thus far, and also the best strikeout minus walk rate because the strikeout rate is peaking. But a lot of guys we talk about on this podcast have an ERA drastically different from their expected ERA, or they might just be getting unlucky and allowing more hits and allowing more runners to score than your average pitcher just because they're getting hit harder. That is not the case with Jamison Tyon this season. He is an ERA of 641, but his expected ERA is 385. Batting average on balls of play, 364. Strand rate, 56%. Those should both regress to his career averages, which are right around league average. 295, 72.5%. So substantial positive regression in both areas, both 10 generally luck categories. The Cubs are also a top five defensive team. So there's no reason why Tyon would be getting victimized by them more so than he would if he was playing for another team. The Astros is a top seven defensive team as well. But the Cubs are getting the better of the splits in this matchup. The Astros lineup has fallen off pretty drastically this season. They are below average offense on the year. But against righties, they rank all the way down at 24th. Against lefties, they're closer to average. So the against righties, the Astros 17% worse than league average. The Cubs are a top 10 team against right-handed pitching, but they actually improved a top five against lefties. So you have Jamison Tyon, who's been grossly unlucky with a good defensive team behind him. The Cubs getting the better of the offensive splits on both ends of the matchup. I like the way the Cubs are trending for the rest of the year. If the Cubs end up in the wild card hunt, I will not be surprised at all. The Cubs end up adding pieces at the deadline. If they're a buyer, I will not be surprised either. So the Cubs in either half have made them closer to plus 130, like them down to about plus 140 for the first five innings, plus 143 for the full game. But they're my favorite underdog. They're my favorite bet on today's slate. And I think the value is pretty obvious considering the splits and where Tyon is pitched relative to his results. All right. Excellent. And those numbers both available at BetMGM as we speak now. Plus 155 for the full game, plus 145 first five line. Cubs are the pick today from Zerillo uh, for his best bet. Underdog for a best bet. Love it. Good start to a Monday. BJ, what do you got for a best bet to start us off? Brewers minus 115 for the first five innings against the St. Louis Cardinals. Jack Flaherty will be on the mound for St. Louis. And we are going on four years now of him outperforming his expected metrics. He's been above a 4.8 expected ERA pitcher for those last four seasons. This season, though, has been a complete and utter disaster. 6.1 expected ERA because his walk per nine rate is at 6.18 through eight starts. That's a pretty decent sample size of not having good control. 
the Brewers are one of the most patient offenses in baseball. They're top five against righties and walk percentage, and they have the sixth lowest chase rate. The stuff plus numbers for Flaherty are really concerning as well. 92 rating, pitching plus, 98. Both of those are the worst in the Cardinals rota- rotation. He's facing Freddie Peralta, who's a pitcher that I know Sean and myself really, really like this season. Stuff plus of 109, pitching plus of 105, which is a little bit better than he was last season when he was a 2-7 expected ERA pitcher. Mm. And his last outing against the Dodgers had a fantastic start, shutting down one of the best lineups against right-handed baseball, only three hits and one run over six innings of work. I've mentioned this before, but the, the velocity and stuff plus and spin rates are all up significantly on his fastball and his slider, which are his main two pitches. Plus, he's already faced the Cardinals once this season. He went six innings, gave up four hits, and just one run. And the Cardinals have been very average against right-handed fastballs and sliders. In fact, to be exact, a plus 0.1 run value, which is very, very average. The Brewers also have been the best defensive team in baseball by defensive run saves, so they have an advantage there. While the Cardinals, who historically have been one of the best defensive teams in baseball, is right around league average this season. So I think it's a little crazy that the Brewers are essentially a pick them for the first five innings, given the disparity between these two starting pitchers. I have Peralta and the Brewers projected at minus 147 for the first five innings. And if you look at the weighted on base average and weighted runs created plus numbers against right-handed pitching for both the Brewers and the Cardinals, they're pretty much similar. The Cardinals are only slightly better against right-handed pitching. So I really like the Brewers here for the first five innings at minus 115. All right. Excellent. And the Cardinals, they can't stay hot after coming out of Fenway the way they just played, right? Exactly. They're going There's to come no back way. down to earth. Yeah. It almost, it bums me out now. I almost wish you, this Flaherty guy was pitching against the Red Sox tonight. Yeah. What, what can you do? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to, by the way, everybody, you can say, I, I meant to say this too, in our, our, our giveaway special, you can say nice things about BJ too. I meant to, Throw that in there. I, I say you can, but I, I I'm guessing people out there would love to to write something uh, yeah. mean uh, towards me, which it's is positive. Okay. Positive okay. and negative feedback is. You want to? I mean, if you want to write positive, that's totally fine. Uh, either one, I'm okay right. with. That. I I did run that by BJ before I said that off the top, so I don't want people to think I'm just gaslighting him. <laughs> um, okay, let's go to fade the public, and no surprise, folks are fading the Oakland A's, eighty eight percent of the cash 96 percent of the tickets coming in on arizona tonight arizona visiting oakland wow this oakland days team i will say charlie disturco did the show on friday and he made a talladega nights reference that's been charlie's new thing he, he uses a movie reference like a, if you were and it, it's good for fridays too because people stay home they want to catch a flick when they want to stay home and not do anything or watch baseball or watch the oakland days and oakland delivered an extra innings marvelous because i bet the a's too with charlie and it was great and they had no reason to win that game right it was crazy going into extras and they won the game nine seven walk off home run but they're really bad huh nine and 33 and the folks the people zarillo are not uh going to bet them so i'm asking you on this monday with the a's at uh, let me see right now here at bet mgm sorry i just lost my Here they are. They're at plus 165, Arizona minus 200. Are you willing to go to Oakland on this Monday? Need the line to come up more in order to consider betting the A's. The A's, by the way, pacing for a 35-win season, which would be one of the worst in Major League history. That is the worst since the 2003 Detroit Tigers, who went 43 and 119. Pud Rodriguez, I believe, was on that team. Jeremy Bonderman lost 20 games. They were bad, bad. Uh, I watched a lot of that season. I was... 14 years old and the Detroit Tigers were a marvel because they were one of the worst teams in the history of professional sports. And the Oakland A's have entered that conversation later. What's that? Then the Tigers became a contender a few years later. So maybe is that what's going to happen when they're in Vegas? Yeah. You know, um, they're going to get an injection of money when they go to Vegas. There's a lot of major league players, Joey Gallo, Bryce Harper, who were from the Las Vegas area, Chris Bryant as well. Um, so yes, like moving to Vegas is not only going to inject them with money, but also inject them with player interest in terms of going and living back home in Vegas or playing in Vegas on top of maybe Billy Bean gets back involved and is able to build some funky super team built around these new rules and the crazy offensive environment that they're likely to have there because it will immediately play like Coors Field off the bat, considering 
the air density and the elevation. So yeah, Las Vegas is going to be absolutely nuts when they move a team there. I'm excited to see what the A's are able to do with it in terms of team building because the Rockies have been primed for some GM to come in there and try some crazy strategy for the past 25 years and nobody's done it. I want to see somebody come in and get me a bunch of Framber Valdezes who are going to throw a ground ball 65% of the time in course Field or something like that, but nobody's ever really tried it. So curious to see if the, the A's are actually a bit innovative in how they go about it. But in terms of Monday's game, I probably needed to come up closer to plus 200. I made this line about plus 175 uh, for the A's even at home, which I mentioned last week. Um, I'm not sure if I said it on the show. I don't believe I did because I wasn't on Friday, but there's been, you know, thousands of teams who have been a home underdog in the past few seasons, but only about 10% of the time is there an underdog great or sorry, only about 2% of the time is there an underdog at home greater than plus 200. It's really hard to get over plus 200 as a home team. The A's have already done it twice this season, I believe. They're going to have to do it again, but that's where I needed to get to in order to bet it is probably plus 200 or higher at projecting it at plus 175, but just knowing the rarity with what you get a plus 200 home dog. Okay. And by the way, I had those backwards. So it's 96% of the dollars coming in are on Arizona. So, and then 88% of the tickets. So just, it's still, you know, unbelievably sized numbers, uh, no matter which way you look at it. BJ, are you willing to back Oakland tonight and fade the public on Arizona? No, I'm with Sean. I needed it to be two or two to one or, or better. I mean, rosinski has been terrible. Like he's kind of walked for nine rate over five and his strikeout for nine rate is under four. He's been atrocious. I have no interest in backing him. Seeing Merrill Kelly though, as a minus 200 road favorite uh, is a little shocking, but that just tells you how bad this ACE team is, but no, I'm passing. Yeah, the A's are like starting to break my model. I don't, I don't know about you, BJ, where I just yep. like have to manually downgrade them in certain need, areas yep. just to yep. Yep. make it a little bit more reasonable in terms of where I think the line is going to come out because yep. otherwise we'll just be betting on them every day. Yeah, and I don't, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> but they, yeah, they, they've like broken my model. Like the, you know, the yep. the preseason yep. projections, like whatever that's waiting in is kind of worthless now. They're we we talked about it like Brent Brent Rickers having an MVP caliber season, and they're still so horrible. It's not like everybody on the team is playing that poorly um their pitching is just the worst thing i've ever seen and defense the yeah. first five over is juiced to uh the four and a half is juiced to minus 130 and i bring that up because like you guys said merrill kelly hasn't been he's been good but he has he's allowed a home run in three of his last four starts he hasn't been i would imagine his expected era is not wonderful 4.3 like he's fine he's an average mlb pitcher and he's minus 200 on the road that's where we're at Right That's where now. we're at with the A's. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which means you have to project the A's pitching closer to like six, six and a half in terms of an ERA if you're getting the Diamondbacks up to minus yeah. 200 against the, yeah. you know, with a guy yeah. who's a 4.3 pitcher. So, yeah, like that's how bad the, the A's pitching is. You have to project it over like a six earned run average in order to get this line to minus 200. And they also still claim the highest, uh, ERA in baseball, it's just over seven. Bullpen ERA, that is. Bullpen ERA, just over seven, too. So their bullpen's been bad, too. Yeah, starting pitchers, worst as well. Yeah, both so, both areas, terrible. Yeah, they don't, like, they don't, I don't think they have a starting pitcher that I'm, like, dying to battle. Like, even when they were bad, it's like, okay, well, Frankie Montas was coming up every, you know, four or five days. So now they just don't have anybody that I get excited. Yeah, they had Miller, but he's hurt. Um, cool. Yeah. Hopeless. Sorry, A's fans. So Oakland is not a dog we are willing to back on today's show. We Zarello already talked about the Cubs as his favorite bet today against Houston as a dog. And you're both on the same underdog as we get to our underdog of the day. And we're going to fade the Padres with the Royals. What do you got, mm -hmm. Zarello? Yeah, consensus underdog did not force this one, though. The Cubs are legitimately my favorite bet, favorite underdog, but the favorite underdog that we have left is the Kansas city Royals. I like them to both have projected them closer to plus plus one fifty. We've talked a lot about Brad Keller. I've written a lot about Brad Keller this season. He's having a very odd year because I know for a fact that he's not hurt. Um, the velocity, everything holds up fine. He's just struggling and tinkering with his pitch mix. He went to drive line baseball over the winter, swapped out his entire arsenal, four seam fastball became a cutter slider, became a sweeper, added a curveball. It wasn't working. 
he was throwing his curveball as much as 40% of the time through his first four starts. And then he scrapped it almost completely. He started pushing his slider up, his changeup up. His slider got up close to 50% in his last start. His last five starts, he has 13 walks and 24 strikeouts, which is about as bad as it gets in terms of a major league pitcher being able to stay in rotation and walk and strike out guys. Uh, but I I know the form is going to come for Keller. I see it. I've watched all of these starts. He's going to find it. He's just tink tinkering with his pitch mix, and he hasn't found it yet, but it's coming. Uh, and I think throwing this slider more might be the key. He threw it about as much as he ever has in his last start. So I would expect to see that again. He kept walking guys and then getting a double play ball immediately. Everything was on the ground in the infield. The Royals just have a horrendous defense and they let a few of those get through. But if you look at these two pitchers on paper, Brad Keller, Michael Waka, Fangraph's projections across five different systems basically views them as the same pitcher. Their FIP ranges for both pitchers, 4.6 to 5.15, essentially identical across those five projections. So on paper, they're very similar pitchers. Obviously, the advantage for the Padres elsewhere, but I made this line about 40% for Kansas City. So anything plus 165 or better in either half would be a bet for me. They're certainly within range of both of those. And Keller's a guy I'm just going to keep backing, expecting him to find it at some point. You know, I've, I've downgraded him, I guess, a little bit relative to where I had him earlier in the year when I thought he would improve off of the new pitch mix, and I have him back to previous levels. But even there, I still like him. Plus 170, both halves right now at yep. BetMGM. BJ, you're on Kansas City as well, the consensus dog. Your arguments for the Royals. I am, and I'm just going to echo everything Sean has said about Brad Keller, but I'll, I'll talk about Michael Waka, uh, who's going who's gonna to be facing, who has vastly outperformed his expected metrics going on four years now and really did uh, you know vastly outperformed with Boston last season. Through seven starts this season, he's around a five expected year. It's all because... All of his pitches are just incredibly below average. His stuff plus rating is 90, but his location plus rating is 103. So he's getting by with very below average stuff and just locating his pitch as well. But what tends to happen with pitchers like Michael Waka, you can't outrun your expected metrics, Brendan. Eventually, they will catch up with you. You can't just keep getting hard, getting hit hard over and over again. Balls will eventually start finding the gaps. Balls will eventually start going over the fence. And, you know, like Sean mentioned, you know, Brad Keller has had really had struggled with his location, really struggled with his control. And the Royals offense has been bad. I mean, they're near the bottom and weighted on base average weighted runs created plus against right-handed pitching. You know, from a talent perspective, obviously the Padres have been significantly better. But if you look at the Royals bullpen, like it's not terrible. It's right around league average, like stuff plus rating of 105. They're 14th and next fifth. And they actually have the second highest K per nine rate in baseball. So I agree with Sean. I had projected the Royals at, at plus 143. So, you know, anything plus 165 or better, uh, there's definitely some value on the Royals. Quickly, Padres have lost seven of eight. We talked about this Friday. I know neither of you were on that pod. It was myself, BG, uh, myself, Tabundo, and Charlie. And I asked them both going into the weekend, are you willing to look into the Padres to win the NL West at plus 160? Well, now they're plus 400 after getting swept and scoring only four runs against the Dodgers over the weekend. Zarillo, are you, where are you at with the Padres? I know you were really high on them before the year started. Yeah, let me see where, where Fangraphs has them currently, because I was thinking about it around the same time that you talked about it when they were only three and a half games back of the Dodgers. And it right. seemed like it would be a reasonable, but now Fangraphs has them at 13% to win the division, which is probably closer to plus 750, plus 800. Um, and no, plus 400 right now at BetMGM. Yeah, so that, that's nowhere within range. And Pakoda has them at 18.5%, which is, let's get the implied number on that. I believe that is um, plus 440. So it's still out of range on both numbers. I would okay. probably pass at this point if you're looking to make a bet on the Padres maybe to make the playoffs, but even that is probably juiced up. So yeah, no, no interest probably for me in those markets. Frankly, the futures market has been really tight for most of the year. Um, I think they've done a good job updating and keeping it up to date on a day-to-day -day basis. Cause I really, every time I've tried to look for value on some of these teams from a futures perspective, it has been difficult since we are talking about team futures, just really quickly, the Mets playing the nationals today, Patrick Corbin on the mound, likely to win that game. I've been saying for the past week, I'm going to met the Mets to miss the playoffs. 
either tonight or tomorrow morning after that game because the Mets schedule for the next six weeks is probably their most difficult stretch of the entire season. They play almost nothing but playoff teams. Okay, some final bets from both of you. And I should have said off the top, I usually do, I forgot. Zerillo's got opening pitch up at actionnetwork.com in the app. His write-up breaks down uh, the day's slate. And he's got some uh, very friendly graphs that are easy on the eyes to help you understand what he's talking about elsewhere, too. So, Zerillo, you've got one more you want to add. BJ's got a few more, too. Yeah, BJ and I both on the Reds' first five money line here. I think it's a little short. I made it minus 135. I believe BJ made it closer to minus 145 or minus 150 for Hunter Green going against Connor Siebold. Siebold, 5'6", expected ERA for his career. He has pitched a little bit better this year. He's more of a pitch-to-contact guy, and the Rockies actually do have a good team defense. So I like the first five under in this matchup when I bet it, probably out of range now. But if you get six at plus money, under would be my bet for the first five innings. But I also like the first five money line for the Reds, as I said, projected it closer to minus 135. So you can bet that up to minus 125 for Hunter Green. Curious to see how his slider looks going into course field. Sometimes these guys who are very heavy on a breaking ball can struggle with their command and course. So maybe Green blows up both the money line and the first five under. But based on where I have these numbers projected, how I view him as a pitcher relative to Connor Siebold, value on both the under and the Reds for the first five innings. Excellent. And BJ, you've got a, you've got that one plus a couple other first fives you want to give out. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo that. I do like the Reds for the first five innings. I think Connor Green is a significantly better pitcher than Connor Siebold. And if you look at both the Reds and the Rockies against right-handed pitching, they're essentially even. You know, the Rockies are just having an advantage defensively. You know, that Royals-Padres game, I do like the under nine runs. You know, minus you can play, you know, minus one ten or better. Uh, you know, Walk obviously been good with his location. Like I already mentioned, the Royals being bad against right-handed pitching. And then Hopefully Brad Keller can figure out his pitch mix. And once he does, I think the sky's the limit for him in that Royals rotation. I also like the Angels for the first five innings. Going to fade Grayson Rodriguez with Shohei Otani. I mean, Grayson is obviously a really highly touted prospect. He's been okay through his first few starts. His stuff plus is sitting around average, you know, 100, with the pitching plus of 103. Uh, Shohei, now that uh, Jacob deGrom is hurt, is number one in baseball and stuff mm. plus every pitch is just incredible so uh this is one of those scenarios where uh i believe shohei is a tad undervalued and i do like the twins for the first five innings you like this brennan fading noah Syndergaard with pablo lopez i mean pablo lopez has been a incredibly solid three five xera pitcher for four years now and Syndergaard has obviously fallen off a cliff so you know fading the dodgers lineup was one of the best against right-handed pitching is kind of troublesome but the Twins are much better against right-handed pitching than they are against lefties. So I like the Twins for the first five at even money. I just want to comment Shohei Otani still quadrupled the price for AL Cy Young as he is for American League MVP. He's even money for MVP. He's four to one for American League Cy Young. If you're going to bet those, bet the Cy Young odds. I was on him Cy Young coming into the season. Once Rodon got hurt, I said he was the best pitcher in the American League. He is the best pitcher in the American League. Bet Shohei Otani if you're going to bet Otani for either MVP or Cy Young, bet him for Cy Young right now. But I have four to one's a little short. You're betting on health, but I, I think he is likely to get the double this year. And hopefully he doesn't get traded to the National League. Get the yes. you think he yes, can win biggest both? Risk. You think he can win both? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, if he's winning Cy I mean, Young, he's, he's the winning favorite MVP. to win the MVP. So. If he's winning Cy Young, he's winning MVP, right? Like that it's be almost impossible to deny him both if he wins Cy Young. Um I I was searching for somewhere desperately that would let me parlay both of those together in the off season uh, to their, you know, uh, to their benefit. They shut those down. But uh, sure. yeah, I mean, Otani is, he projects as the best pitcher. The stuff plus says he's the best pitcher. It's as BJ said, a question of, does he get traded and does he make 28 to 30 starts because they only pitch him once a week. So you do have the workload concerns, but uh, the numbers say he should be there at the end. Maybe he'll be on the Vegas A's in a few years. Mm. Bryce Harper. Mm. Unless Bryce Harper says what he said to the Rockies, to the A's that you're a- My prediction, and I've said this before, my prediction remains is the Mets trapped to the phase. Okay. Excellent. All right. Some plus money dogs. Well, of course, dogs are plus money, but dogs all over the episode today. Uh, like it. Good stuff, fellas. Uh, 12 game slate. If you need more, again, you can find uh, Zerillo and BJ Cunningham in the Action Network app if they add anything else to their betting cards. 
for Monday slate. Zerillo's opening pitch article is up right now at actionnetwork.com. You can find the article as well in the app. So, uh, folks, please also, uh, one more reminder, leave that five-star rating and a review, positive or negative, for a chance to win a free year of Action Pro or some sort of Action Network swag. We're going to take this all the way up until the end of the month. So we're giving you some more time, and we would really appreciate, good or bad, your feedback. For Sean Zarello, BJ Cunningham, Brendan Glasheen, we are back. The pod's back tomorrow, Tuesday. Thanks for listening to Payoff Pitch, Action Network's MLB betting podcast presented by BetMGM. Good luck, and we will talk to you tomorrow.